seeing, hopefully you're seeing a poll. Um, it should still be up and running. Um, yep, that's we have a, a poll um, to help us with our programming. Um, so <clears throat> please, if you can answer uh, the best of your abilities, it's five questions, six questions, I believe on this one. And then at, towards the end of our program, um, closer to eight o'clock, I will have one about the survey about our program, as well as if there's anything else or particulars you may care to hear. Um, but Patty uh, Dixon is our horticulturist in the office in the Ocean County as well. So Patty has put all this great stuff together for us. So thank you, Patty. Um, and Irene Wanitz, a master gardener extraordinaire in both Ocean and Monmouth <laughs> County. Uh, so I want to thank you. And uh, we have another, two, we have two and a half minutes on the poll and then it's going to go away. But thank you, everybody. And I'm going to let, let you go, Irene. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody. Happy, happy spring is finally here, even though it doesn't feel like it, but at least it was sunny. Uh, I'm very happy that you can join us. And because you are joining us, I can tell that you are serious about native plants. Oh, geez. Why is it not advanced? Oh, there it is. Okay. What is a native plant? Okay, a native plant is a plant that grew in North America prior to all the people coming over from Europe and wherever. And not all the wildflowers that you see growing on the side of the road or wherever are considered um, to be native. Dandelions, which uh, not everybody enjoys and loves. Queen's Anne's Lace, which I enjoy and love. They arrived in North America with the European settlers. They were not here prior to that. And also there are now, and there were uh, a lot of invasive plants that have come from all corners of the world. And they're spreading uh, rampantly and overtaking some areas, which is a real shame. Okay, why use native plants? Because they occur naturally in the region in which they've evolved. And that means that they have adapted to the local soils, the rainfall, the temperature conditions, although the temperatures are changing at this time. And they have a relationship with all the creatures, good and bad, that have lived in their area. And uh, they have developed whatever natural defenses for these uh, insects and these diseases. And they are tough and durable and adaptable, just like us. Gardeners are like that, aren't they? We are tough, durable, and adaptable. We have to be. Okay, they are env environmentally friendly because they will grow with minimal use of water as well as fertilizers, pesticides when planted in similar conditions. This does not mean that you don't need to have water or water these plants or give them some sort of nutrients, hopefully through compost. Okay, why choose native plants? These colorful plants have uh, nectar and pollen all different times of the growing season for our wildlife, which is uh, the butterflies, hummingbirds, bees, and other pollinators, as well as beneficial insects. Remember, not all insects are bad. Okay, native plants attract beneficial wildlife by providing best source of food, such as seeds and berries for birds and other wildlife. And they also provide nesting places and cover for frogs, birds, dragonflies, and other critters. And uh, using these native plants preserve the balance and the beauty of our natural ecosystems that we are living in and hopefully we'll return to that. Uh, what you will learn and uh, you will see, uh, not on my slides, but of course on this slide, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, that native plants have nice long roots. Some of these roots can go down to 15 feet and that's good because they help to clean the water that goes through the rain and whatever and provide nutrients to the soil. And also it makes them also be drought tolerant. So you've heard this hackneyed phrase before and you will hear it again from me because you have to choose the right plant for the right spot. 
And what does that mean? That means number one, know your hardiness zone. If you want your plants to come back, you need to make sure that they are the kind of plants that will come back in your hardiness zone. The hardiness zone are divided by 10 degrees with the lowest temp average temperature in the winter time. And then they make a nice list of them and we are zone 6B to 7B. And uh, if you want them to come back, this is uh, what you need to look at when you're reading the label. Um, if you are planning to plant plant and planters and you are living in the eastern coast, especially of New Jersey, uh, these plants that you will be putting in containers need to be zone five or lower, just like the store, five and below. Um, so two hardiness zones colder than our zone seven. All right, as far as uh, you need to make a site assessment to make sure that these plants will survive. So these are the questions that you need to ask yourself. How much light or full sun does a site get during the day? How much natural moisture, not from your hose, but natural moisture from rain or from uh, whatever water table you may have? And also what type of soil type do you have? And uh, there are many plants that will do well in all these situations, including salty, which is really toxic and very difficult for plants. Um, so when you're looking at the area where you're going to be planting, you need to know how much sunlight does that site get during the day? You have to observe this and not guess because I always thought I had more sun than I actually did. So the best way to do this is to either use your smartphone or to use a digital camera and take pictures throughout the day during a week or two week period uh, at that site. And then after you're done, look at those pictures because the wonderful thing about these digital cameras are that they are time stamped. So you will see that 10 o'clock in the morning, you had sun, but wow, three o'clock in the afternoon, the sun wasn't there. So that doesn't mean that you have sun all the whole day. And the best months of, of to do this is in May, June, and July. That's after all the canopies of the trees have filled in. Uh, so full sun, whether you like it or not, <laughs> is a minimum of six or more hours of sun. And this is mostly between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And remember, the afternoon sun is the hot sun. So if you have this amount of sunlight, you have a vast variety of plants that you can uh, have in your garden. And remember, you need to observe and check it out because that's really important. You don't want to be buying plants that will be dying because they don't have enough sun. Here is a picture uh, that can give you an example of how much sunlight uh, happens uh, depending on how many trees or whatever that you have that's on your property or next to your property that is affecting how much sun goes into your property. Uh, so remember, six to eight hours of direct sun is really important if you want full sun. And then there's part shade, part sun, they're interchangeable. And then deep shade, full shade is three to four sunlight, four hours of sunlight, whether it's direct or if it's all day dappled uh, shade, if you see the sun dancing on the grass and read your labels. And when you do read your labels, they will always have some sort of uh, symbol that will tell you what kind of sunlight it, ne it needs. This is full sun and it will have a sun. And full sun, uh, some plants have more than one choice. This one, Baptisia, you can plant either in full sun or in part shade. Now, Whenever you have a choice between two, you always pick the first one. That's the optimum uh, for that plant. And it will do its best. It will have the most flowers. It'll be more lush. If you choose the other one because of the, your situation, 
the plants won't be as lush and they will not have as many blooms. And then here we have uh, part shade to full shade. Remember, full shade is not under your porch tank shade. There needs to be some sort of light there, either three to four hours or a dapple shade all day. Dapple sun, rather. Okay, in your handout that you have received, there is a nice summary of uh, uh, what is full sun, full shade, and part shade. Uh, so full sun, six to eight hours, full shade, at least four hours, and anything in between, which makes it easy, is part shade or part sun. Again, read your labels and make sure that you plant, you choose the plants that are suited to your area. Moisture, really important. Plants need water. Uh, so what kind of natural moisture does your site get? If it's dry, um, that means that the water doesn't stay there very long. Usually, if you have sandy soil, the water goes right through. Also, if you have a slope, usually the water runs right down. Also, dry shade means that there's it's probably under a tree. Therefore, there's a root competition of the moisture or there are some walls or eaves or fences that don't allow the water to go to the area that you need that water. So dryness really deprives the plants of vital moisture for healthy growth. So choose plants that are drought tolerant once they're established. Now, what does that mean once they're established? You can't just buy a plant and just stick it in the soil water it once and walk away. What that means is when you plant your plant, you need to water it, and then you need to water it however much it is needed. Maybe every day if it's very hot or every other day or once a week, you check out the plant and see how the leaves look. If they look like they're sort of drooping, make sure that you water it. And you keep doing this until you tug at the plant and you see that it, it isn't budging at all. That means that it feels that it's at home and that it has sent out its roots into your native soil and it feels that it's at home so it's established and once it's established you don't have to be watering it as frequently however for the first season you do need to water it when it's a hot spell where it hasn't rained for a while after that, the second year and going forward, you really don't have to worry about it unless it's really a long dry period, which we have at times. Uh, in your handout, I have all these plants listed, so I'm not going to go through them, but I thought you'd like to see the colorful, the blooms and how they look but you don't have to write this all down. It's all in your handouts. And uh, as you can see, I have listed, I have uh, New Jersey natives because uh, natives that are from your area will do best that are in your area because they have been living here all these years and they know how to survive and do well. Um, also here are perennials. Uh, before there were uh, shrubs, here are these wonderful perennials. Again, I've listed some New Jersey uh, perennials, and then there are some from other parts of the United States. And they all do very well once they're established. Here on the corner you see, uh, and I have this at the end of your handout, two different sites that you can go to to see if the plants are suited for your area, if they are native. And New Jersey Yards is a really great site to go to. It would help you, it will help you pick out the plants. In fact, they may even tell, they will even tell you which plants are suited for whatever your conditions are. Um, we're still with moisture. Uh, I happen to have a high water table, so I know very well uh, what happens when plants are sitting in water. Moist means that the the area gets wet, but uh, and gets saturated occasionally, but the water goes away. Wet means that 
Like you see in the picture below, the water just sits there and it could sit there for days. This, uh, these pictures I took one day riding home uh, from a lunch out and I made my husband stop the car. I took the picture and the close up over here is a duck. And if you have any ducks in your yard that are, that are swimming, then you do have a problem. Now, there are many plants that will do very well in this type of condition. However, most plants will not do well, hence uh, this, this guy here. And what happens if uh, plants are sitting in a wet area, the plants cannot get that oxygen out of the water and they drown just like we would drown if we wouldn't, didn't know how to swim. So the roots drown and then they die and they rot away. So when you go to your garden and you see in the spring that a certain plant isn't there anymore, it may have uh, died, not because it was an awful winter, but maybe it was sitting in water because we do get a lot of rain in the spring and in the fall. Uh, this is my yard. <laughs> Uh, I had my husband and my son build me a raised bed so I can plant vegetables because you are never, never supposed to be planting in wet soil, especially in clay soil, which is what I have. So you can see this is what the back of my garden looks like. Uh, so I have these ra raised beds. And uh, in another area of my garden, I have water that sits and I have plants that do very well. This is creeping phlox or phlox stolonifera, which does very well, can sit in water for a week or however long, and it will do well and you will see it later. Uh, here are some shrubs that do very well with wet feet. They are listed in your handout, so I'm not going to go over it, but I just want to show you that, you know, years ago, I used to think native plants were these rangy, ugly plants that you didn't want to have in your garden because it sort of looked messy. But look at these plants. They all look lush and wonderful, and there are so many wonderful native plants that you can have in your garden. And as you can see, uh, some of them, if not all of them, are New Jersey natives. And here we have some perennials that also don't mind sitting uh, in uh, having wet feet. And there are some New Jersey natives also. Look at how colorful they are. Really beautiful plants, and I will be talking about some of them later. The next thing that you need to know is what kind of soil do you have? Is it sandy? And um, or clay or loamy. This is the size of a sand particle. And this is how small the clay particle is. This is what I have. So water goes right through the sand because there are uh, these nice big air spaces. Whereas in clay soil, um, it usually it holds on to that water. And the deal breaker here is if you have, if you're living by the shore or on a street where, well, if you have a lot of snow and they dump the snow in your yard, if you have salty soil, then it's very difficult, but there are many plants and you will see them as we go on. Uh, here are some uh, salt tolerant plants. As you can see, there are some repeats from the previous slides and they are all New Jersey natives and they're listed in your handout. And here are salt tolerant perennials and most of them are New Jersey also. Look how colorful they are. And grasses. Grasses are wonderful. They're easy and they tolerate salt very, very well. Uh, I never, I didn't used to have deer, but now, but I have had them for quite a while now. Uh, we unfortunately have unwanted wildlife, not only deer, but rabbits and this creature here that I really hate very, very much because this creature eats plants that the deer don't eat. So I don't know sometimes which plant, which uh, animal is feasting on my uh, sometimes expensive plants. So they, there are lists of plants uh, that uh, the deer won't eat or the rabbits won't eat. I'm waiting for a list that these uh, um, 
animals will not eat and I have yet to find them. However, with whatever those lists say, these animals do not know how to read. And it all depends in what area they're in and also what they have available to eat. Uh, there is a reference sheet that uh, Rutgers has put out. And again, depending on the area where you live, they, they, uh, <laughs> what they say may not hold true. All right, so uh, we have, uh, there are plants that the deer will not eat. Usually plants that are heavily fragranced, like mint uh, or basil, they will not eat. Fuzzy or hairy or finely di dissected plants like ferns, the deer don't like that uh, texture against their tongue. There are also toxic plants, poisonous, that the deer will not eat. But if there's nothing else, they will eat them and they will be sick and not healthy. But if there's nothing else, they will definitely eat them. And then there are prickly plants that have spines on their leaves. But uh, for whatever reason, deer love hollies and roses. So yes, yeah, some plants they will not eat that have spines, but with deer, nothing is definitive. And ornamental grasses, they don't eat that because they don't like the mouthfeel. And here are uh, pictures of wonderful deer resistant plants. I'm saying deer resistant, not deer proof plants, because again, they will eat whatever is available. And here are these wonderful perennials. And here are some oriental grasses, and all of these are listed in your uh, handout. Again, choose the right plant for the right spot. So make sure that you read those labels. Make sure that you read all the requirements that are necessary for that plant to be in your garden. The light requirement, how much moisture they need, if they can stand wet feet, how high and how wide they're going to be is very important. Uh, because you don't want to be planting plants that you may need to be cutting or moving all the time. Uh, now, many of you, the reason why you're into native plants or want to be into native plants is because you care about the butterflies. And the population of butterflies, unfortunately, has been declining. Uh, however, there are 700 species of native butterflies in North America, and here are 35 butterflies of New Jersey. There may be more, there may be less. You have to remember that when a butterfly is flying, they don't see the borders like we see on the map. So uh, the butterflies go wherever their food is. And uh, butterflies and uh, are called Lepidopteras. So um, uh, these are the wonderful uh, butterflies that we have in the Atlantic area. We also have a lot of moths, a lot of more, more moths than we have butterflies. And they are also in the Lepidoptera family. Uh, so we all have babies and so do these lepidopteras the butterflies and the moths and they are they lay their eggs and when the eggs hatch these are the larvae that uh, come out and this is the stage where they do all of their eating and the larva, another name for that is caterpillar and most of their time is spent eating and they just, uh, the mother butterfly, the female butterfly, doesn't lay her eggs just on any plants. She makes uh, sure that she chooses the plant that the, her eggs, her larva can eat. And these plants are called host plants. And the butterflies, most butterflies are very specific as to which plant they will lay their eggs because they want that next generation. So make sure that you, I have listed a whole bunch of uh, host plants in this program. Uh, so host plants are important, not only to the Lepidoptera, but also to birds. 
And why is that important? Because the babies in the spring, just like our babies, they cannot eat solid food, neither can the babies of these birds. They need to have something that's nice and soft and squishy. And what is so nice and soft and squishy but all those wonderful caterpillars. So we need to have as many caterpillars as we possibly can. So please, if you can have these host plants, please try to have them. And you will see oh, they're all beautiful plants. Another uh, type of pollinator we have are bees. We have the honeybees that come from uh, Europe and from China, and we have also our native bees. And our native bees, as you can see, are a lot more efficient than those uh, foreigners that are coming here, but we need both of them in order to have the food that we need. And uh, these are some of our 4,000 native bee species. And I know you can't see all the maps, but out of all of these that are shown here, there's only one bee that, it, that doesn't come to New Jersey. So all of these bees come to New Jersey. And these native bees are very important because these bees, some of them are very specific bees, they're specialists, and some of them only pollinate, pollinate uh, like tomato plants or some just squash plants. So they're very, very important in order for us to have the food that we are eating. Uh, one of our native uh, bees is the bumblebee. It's one of a few bumblebee uh, species and stinging humans is not one of the, one of their jobs. Uh, when I worked at garden centers, my job was to water the plants and I would water them a few times a day and not once was I ever stung because the bees are not interested in me or anybody. They have their job to collect as much nectar and as much uh, pollen as possible, not to sting you. That is not what they're there for. And look at the difference this is, uh, of uh, what foods you will not have if we don't have those bees. So it's very important to have um, those blooms and the pollen and the nectar that they need. Uh, also, wasps are pollinators too. And here are some common species. Uh, wasps aren't, aren't so nice, but they do pollinate our plants. And flies. These are the forgotten pollinators that nobody really talks much about. Uh, they have various names, uh, flower flies, drone flies, hover flies, surfeit flies, and they are, look, what's amazing about them, they look like bees, don't they? And why do you think they look like bees? So that they will not be eaten by birds or other predators. Every, every, every living thing wants to survive. They want to live. They don't want to be eaten. And of course, let's not forget the wonderful hummingbirds that we all crave to have come to our garden because they are so beautiful. Uh, here is my symbols key, and I will explain them uh, as we go through the plants. Uh, I always start my talks when I'm doing uh, uh, any kind of talks about uh, flowers and whatever with shrubs, because I think shrubs are really very important. They are the backbone of a garden, the skeleton of a garden, and many times this is what we see during the winter time. Uh, and I always start with whatever is evergreen, because you want to see something there during the winter, especially when it's bleak outside. And here we have inkberry holly, which is wonderful native of New Jersey. It's evergreen, and it is uh, native to the East Coast and many areas. And um, what was wonderful about this plant is that it is also, it, it brings in the pollinators when it has the blooms and uh, it also has berries, but only the female has berries. And in order for the female to have the berries, 
this holly and all hollies, except for one, needs to have a male holly in order to make sure that it's pollinated. Uh, what's great about this plant, it is also a host plant. And I put this here all the time to let you know. Uh, so let me explain my icons. What I do is I always put the name of the plant that I'm talking about. I always put the botanical or scientific name. I put the common name that is used in our area. And then I put whatever uh, sunlight it needs part shade, part sun, sun, full shade, which is a wonderful thing if you have a plant that can tolerate all of these and do well in all three of these uh, light areas. And here is the symbol that means that the deer will not eat it. It's deer resistant, and this is rabbit resistant. Uh, here, um, if you can um, do some sort of shearing, uh, to prune it, you can. And then I have how tall and then how wide the plant will be, especially when you're planting shrubs, because you don't want to be planting them in front of windows, next to a driveway or walkway or a doorway. So you really need to read uh, how big and how wide the plant will be. And then I always put the zone because if you want to be planting it in containers, besides the fact that you want it to come back. And then I put a symbol of a Christmas tree, meaning that will come back. And if it's a New Jersey native, I will put New Jersey. Easy care, which means you really don't have to do much. No maintenance, which means you really don't need to do anything. And four seasons of color because it is evergreen. And then other uh, facts that are really good to know. And because of those roots that I had mentioned before, it is great for erosion control. It keeps the soil from blowing away. And then I have here always the bloom time. Uh, that's important because I want to make you want to make sure that when the plants are blooming, that you're there to see it bloom. If you go away, let's say June, you don't want to be planting something that's going to be blooming only in June. And then I have this pollinator friendly, which means that butterflies and bees and other pollinators will be happy to come and uh uh, take the nectar or the pollen of the plant. And then birds, birds love the seeds and other, they use uh, sometimes the leaves or the twigs for nests. So I always put if birds like this type of plant too. Then I have this symbol, which means that it has something interesting. And this will have these berries. Uh, which are really droops <laughs> because it only has one seed inside. In fact, like the cherries, they're really droops. They're not berries. But anyway, we call them berries. But in order for this plant to have these wonderful ink berries, uh, they do need to have the male plant. They have this wonderful shiny foliage and uh, they do tend to sucker, although mine have never really suckered. And mean, that means that they send out a, a stem that comes up and it, it's a new stem and it becomes a new plant and it can form a colony. But I have never really seen uh, these inkberry hollies suckering. Then I put down what kind of soil you need, whether it's average or fertile or poor soil, and whether it can take sandy soil or clay soil. And then very important, as I mentioned before, some plants can stem being uh, in a moist soil and some cannot. This one can stand being in moist soil, but because it can stand moist soil doesn't mean that that soil needs to be moist. It can be ordinary soil and it will do very, very well. Just don't let it dry out too much, especially during a hot, dry spell where we haven't had any rain for a long time. And those of you who live by the shore, this is the, these are the symbols to, to, uh, to watch for. And those of you who live in the city, some plants can't take that pollution from all those cars. This plant can do that very well. 
Uh, now, the thing with Inkberry hollies is, as you can see with this plant here, it gets leggy, which means that there are no leaves on the stem and you see the, the stems and many people don't like that. So in order to not see that, you plant something in front of it or you get something like this inkberry holly which is called strongbox it's a, a north american native selection and it only grows two to three feet high and wide and it is uh hardy in this area it does get berries although this one does not because it is a female and they haven't had uh, they haven't found a male uh, that is suitable for this female. I also put whether something blooms on new wood or old wood. When it says old wood, that means that you uh, you don't prune the stems uh, in the fall or in the winter or in the spring because the flowers will be only on the stem from the previous year. They will not be on the new stems that grow that year. Uh, when you see this, this tells you that spring is here. It's a wonderful tree. It's a native to the East Coast. And uh, this is, uh, it has these uh, pea-like blooms that uh, wind all around the stems, the branches, including the trunk, even though it's old. And it blooms for a nice long time in early spring. They are edible, so you can throw them in a salad and freak out your friends. You can also fry them, uh, and they're delicious. The leaves are heart-shaped. And the birds like the seed pods, and the seed pods uh, hang around for quite a while. Uh, these, uh, there are many different uh, varieties of uh, these uh, wonderful red buds uh, with colorful leaves and uh, flowers that may have what may be more deeper pink or reddish or even white and even shorter uh, trees. Um, they uh, do not like soggy soil and they don't mind being at the beach. Uh, also, whenever uh, I list the plants and I forgot to mention, this icon means that it can tolerate our heat. This means that it's, uh, I don't know what happened to my, oh here. Uh, this means that it is drought tolerant once it's established. This means this is our New Jersey humidity. And this means that it cannot stand in wet areas. So it does avoid, so avoid soggy soil. And this is what it looks like in the fall. The fall foliage is yellow, but yellow is nice. And uh, it's a really great plant and it does self sow if it's, uh, if it's happy. Another wonderful spring blooming plant is I'm a lankier or service berry. And there is more than one type, uh, one species of this in our area. This one is canadensis. Yes, it grows in Canada, but it doesn't mean that it only grows in Canada. It really means that it grows up north. Uh, these are the blooms and they come even before the leaves come in. And this is a very important plant for pollinators because in the spring they're looking for that nectar and for that pollen. And this plant has plenty of it and it attracts all these pollinators and also beneficial insects, which are really very important. It is also a, a larval host, which is very good. And not the, uh, I tried to, uh, to research whether the, the blooms are edible, I couldn't find it, but what happens is they have these wonderful berries later on in the season, and they are delicious. They taste like blueberry and sort of a strawberry uh, mixed together, but you have to get them early because the birds love them also. Uh, so pick them, and when I was in Montreal a few years ago, I was very tempted to go over and pick some 
but I didn't. Um, but they are really delicious and um, uh, 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 there is a problem with uh, Amelanchier, um, which is um, rust, uh, whatever uh, a disease uh, with that uh, cedar rust. Uh, um, Oh, gee, I forgot what the rest of it is. But anyway, what happens is if you leave the berries on the tree, it will get these uh, orange, ugly looking things on them. So pick them early if you have that problem. There's, they have this wonderful foliage in the fall. So if you want fall colors, this is a wonderful plant to have. And look at how many moths and butterfly this, uh, this amelanchier. Uh, supports. Uh, now, uh, in the slide, I have uh, it attracts beneficial insects, and I want to show you these are just a few of these wonderful beneficial insects that, yes, they do look ugly, and you think that they're bad, but they're not. And you will see that they eat all these terrible things that we don't want on our plants. So, please. Don't be afraid of these beneficial insects. They are good. They are good insects, good bugs. Another wonderful plant that blooms in the spring and also uh, provides a lot of great nectar and pollen for pollinators is this wonderful Fothagilla. This Fothagilla is a, a nice dwarf. It only grows three feet to four feet high. And uh, it is native uh, to, it is not native to our area, but it is very easy care, no maintenance, because you're buying plants that will grow to a certain height, so you don't have to do any kind of pruning. What's wonderful about this plant, you have these wonderful bottle brush type of blooms before the leaves come in. And when the leaves come in, they're sort of grayish and they turn this nice blue green, uh, really nice. And in the fall, look at the beautiful foliage in the fall, all these wonderful shades of orange and red and yellow, all kinds of shade, all depending on how much sun they get. Uh, but this plant, even though it likes moisture, doesn't like to be standing in any kind of soggy soil. Uh, this is God's answer to a lawn in a forest. This is low bush blueberry, and they are extremely drought tolerant, as you can see with these uh, cactuses here, because don't you think there's a whole bunch of competition from all these trees? Uh, so they are very drought tolerant, and they don't mind being in part shade or full shade. Uh, and uh, they, can be in full sun. In fact, uh, places in Maine and in other states, they grow these and you can buy them frozen. They're really wonderful plants. Uh, they're edible, obviously. And uh, the blue, uh, the hummingbirds even love these wonderful blooms. And these are the blueberries that uh, come later in the season. But uh, here I have, I've told you, multi-seasonal interest. What does that mean? That means that it's not just having these wonderful uh, blooms in the spring or the beautiful uh, leaves or these wonderful berries, but also this is what you see in the fall. Look how beautiful. When you're driving down Route 70 or uh, on the parkway in the southern area in Ocean County and below, you will see this on the side. And this is all this wonderful low bush blueberry. And what's great about the low bush blueberry is that it supports all these wonderful uh, butterflies and moths. Uh, and as you can see, this is a wonderful plant if you want to have that wonderful fall foliage. Uh, it does form a colony, as you can see. Uh, here we have this wonderful aronia or chokeberry. 
Uh, aronias usually are tall. They're about five, six, eight feet tall, and they have uh, these wonderful blooms like this one here, and uh, they also have uh, these uh, wonderful berries. Uh, this is a selection of an aronia, and this is the only one that only grows 24 inches high and wide. Uh, it has these wonderful blooms in the spring, and then after the blooms, here's a close-up, you get these wonderful berries. But as you can see, uh, they get these wonderful, uh, beautiful uh, fall foliage. But as you can see with these berries, they look kind of shriveled up. The reason being that when you see these berries and they look like they're ripe and they are ripe, but they're very astringent. And if you try to eat them, you're not gonna like it because, and that's why they're called choke berries. They need to go through at least one or two frosts and then they will taste better. You can make jellies and jams and even uh, liquor out of them. They're really wonderful and they uh, are um, wet site tolerant. They can take everything. They can take uh, heat, drought, humidity, standing in water, uh, sun, part shade, and the wonderful thing besides all of that, the deer don't eat them, neither do the rabbits, and they can be by the shore. So please, this is a wonderful plant. And if and this is a great plant if you have a really small garden because it doesn't take up a lot of space. Another wonderful plant is this uh, um, beach plum. And I wish that I can grow these beech plums, but unfortunately, they don't like my clay. And so I cannot grow them. I tried. And uh, if you have sandy soil, please grow them because you can have these wonderful beech plums that you make, can make wonderful jelly with. Uh, this plant also is one of those that starts blooming early in the spring before the leaves even come in. And it draws all these wonderful pollinators and uh, then the leaves come in and in the fall, you have this wonderful fall foliage. Uh, what's uh, unfortunate about this plant is that it doesn't give you these beech plums every year. I, I think about every two to three years, sometimes four years, you'll get these berries. And it's always good to have more than one beech plum growing because they can cross pollinate. And the more beech plums that you have, the better production of, of these uh, uh, beach plums you will have. And as you can see, this uh, is a larval host for look at how many caterpillars of moths and butterflies. And what's great about this plant is it has a really extensive and great root system. And this is one of those plants that they use whenever they try to build up uh, the beach after a great storm has taken away a, a, a lot of the vegetation. And uh, these beach plums, they, they live for a very long time. And if they are covered up with sand because it's blown over them, they will push their, uh, their branches through the sand because they want to live just like everything else. And sometimes you may not know when you see a beech plum on the beach, that plant may be 30 years old and it may be really deep in that sand. And of course the birds like the beech plums also. Let's see, uh, uh, this suckers and forms a nice, uh, nice bunch of plants. Okay, uh, keystone plants. These, uh, I, I, I went to a symposium and I heard uh, Doug uh, Talamy speak and he was talking about keystone species and keystone plants. And uh, the prunus, which is the beech plum, is one of those species, the prunus species, and that species is uh, they have is uh, cherries, um, uh, plums, apricots, peaches, and almonds, 
and these keystone species and keystone plants are plants, native plants that support the highest number of caterpillars and lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, and native specialist bees that depend on the pollen of these plants. Remember I told you we have a lot of native bees? Well, uh, some of these native bees only pollinate certain plants. Well, these bees also, they only take the pollen from certain plants, not all of the plants that have pollen. So these keystone species and keystone plants not only provide as host plants for the Lepidoptera, but they also provide that special pollen for these specialist bees because not all pollen is created equal. And pollen is full of protein and nutrients. And that's what the bees need because if there would be no pollen, there would be no bees because they cannot live on just nectar. They need to have that pollen in order to have babies. Uh, and also keystone plants are natives. I'm reading this because it, it says it better than I can. So they support the 90% of butterflies, moths, and up to 60% of native bees in a specific ecoregion. Much of this wildlife is also responsible for supporting over three quarters of all flowering plants, thanks to their pollination powers. The plants they support, support provide a third of the food that we eat. So these are really very important. And they are the linchpin of our ecosystems that maintain balance and support biodiversity. So if you can, when you see that the plant supports like a hundred plus of these uh, caterpillars, that means that these are keystone plants or species. Uh, here is another wonderful plant. This is our New Jersey tea, and uh, it only grows two to three feet high and wide, and it does, uh, it does attract uh, hummingbirds because it attracts all kinds of pollinators as well as beneficial insects and other types of insects. And I know people love hummingbirds and they think that hummingbirds only um, need nectar. No, they also need pollen because they need that protein but they also eat insects. And this is one of their favorite plants. Why? Not just because of the nectar, but because it's always full of these wonderful insects that they need in order to have what they need in order to be able to do what they do. So please, if you can, grow this plant. This is what the blooms look like at the end of each stem. These are the buds. I love buds too. I think they look beautiful, not just when they open up. And this is what it looks like in the garden. You can tell it's very floriferous, lots and lots of blooms. And after it's done, look at these cool uh, seed pods. They're triangular and then they turn black and dry up. And then what happens, they open up and then they expel their seeds uh, because they need to have the next generation. All plants want to have that next generation. That's why they have flowers. That's why they need to be fertilized or pollinated. And that's why they need to form those seeds in order to have a next generation. So if you can, please uh, grow this plant and this, uh, plant blooms on new wood, which means that if you want to mow it down or trim it, do it, you can do it in the spring or in the fall or during the winter, and you will have the blooms anyway. Oh, and this is edible. You can dry the leaves. Oh, and when you buy this, the first year that you plant this plant, it will look like it's not doing anything, even though you're watering it because what it's doing is it's building up its root system. And its root system becomes a nice 
nice long tap root. And tap roots are good because they go deep into the soil to make sure that they get that moisture. Because the deeper you dig in the soil, the more moist it is. And that tap root gets to be really, really strong. In fact, uh, farmers used to hate this plant because it used to, it used to um, kill their, their uh, what you call it, plows. It used to break their plows because of the root system. So uh, it may take up to two, maybe even three years before this plant starts doing what it needs to do and look beautiful on top. And then after that, it will be looking gorgeous every year. Another wonderful plant is uh, the Itea, which is the Virginia Sweet Spire. It has this bottle brush uh, bloom, blooms in May to June. And um, hummingbirds love it. It's a nectar paradise. Birds love the seeds. And uh, the young stems are purplish red. And uh, it has beautiful fall foliage. And instead of having that burning bush or other uh, plants that are not native, that are invasive, uh, please plant this plant if you want and need to have that wonderful red foliage in the fall. Uh, and this plant is a wonderful plant. Uh, many times when you're looking for plants on the internet or in catalogs, it will say that it's great for rain garden. And uh, here is a picture of a rain garden. I'm not gonna go into it, but uh, rain gardens are where excess water uh, goes and it stays there for a little bit. And there are plants in the rain garden with these wonderful root systems that help to clean the water that stays in there before it goes into our groundwater. So rain gardens are really good. However, what I've noticed when I've been doing my research, whenever there's a plant that they say loves being in moist soil or even in standing water, you always see this is a great plant for a rain garden. No, it is not. Because if you have a rain garden and it's there to catch any kind of overflow of water from uh, either a downspout or wherever, that only happens when it rains. How many times in uh, during the growing season do have do we have periods where there are weeks where there is no rain and even where it's really very hot? So these plants that they say love wet need to also be drought tolerant. So if you don't see in the description anything that says drought tolerant, please do not buy that plant if you plan to have a rain garden. I don't have a rain garden, but as I said, I have a high water table. I have an areas where plants are in standing water. So I make sure that it says that not only that it can take standing in water, but also that it's drought tolerant because when it doesn't rain and I have clay and you know what happens to clay when it doesn't rain, you get these nice cracks all over the place. So it is very droughty. So please be aware when they say rain garden that they don't really know what they're talking about. Uh, this is a cultivar and uh, the uh, Itea, uh, the native Itea grows really uh, bigger, a lot bigger. This one is smaller. It's very popular. Oh my God, it's already 7.30. Okay, I gotta keep going. Okay, so this is a wonderful plant that has these wonderful uh, blooms and uh, you can make a wonderful hedge. And this is a wonderful plant if you want to have that uh, great uh, full foliage. And as you can see, it has all these wonderful attributes. Uh, so uh, please uh, try to plant this plant. Um, this is a wonderful plant if you like to have beautiful stems, red stems in the uh, during the winter, this is a keystone plant, meaning that it can support, look how many butterflies and moths. 
uh, and also those uh, special uh, those beads that I mentioned before. This is one of the most uh, um, not popular, but it, it, it is this uh, dogwood is one of the ones that we have the most of. And it is not, even though it's red twig and red osier dogwood, sometimes it comes in yellow. This plant grows quite tall, anywhere from six to nine feet tall and as wide. It also suckers and any plants that do sucker, you can control that by uh, taking a spade and just taking that sucker out. Also, when you plant this new plant, do not start cut. Uh, oh, these red stems are on the newer stems. So uh, on the, these new stems, you need to have new stems in order to have this, these red colors. So what you need to do is you need to cut off any stems in the spring that is thicker than your thumb. Uh, because they will not have this red color. But when you plant this plant, you need to wait two to three years to make sure that that plant is well established before you do any kind of pruning of stems. And uh, once it's established after three years, you can take like 25% of those stems in order to have that nice winter coloring. Or if you want, you can just cut it all down to, you know, six to 12 inches and you will have all of these wonderful uh, red stems in the fall and winter. Look how beautiful it looks in the, in the winter time. Uh, and here is what it looks like during the grow, uh, growing season. These are the blooms. I like the buds, like I said before. These are the white berries that the birds like. And this is the nice foliage in the fall. These berries last on the plant for quite a while because it does, these berries do not have as much sugar as other berries for the birds. So these are eaten later. However, even though they don't have that sugar, they do have fat. Don't know how they get the fat in there, but that fat is very important for the birds uh, in order to feed their little, uh, uh, for the birds. So please, you know, and uh, during the winter time. Um, and as you can see here, it does not like to be in the sun, in a dry area. Uh, it needs to be in a moist area or wet area but uh, this symbol here means that it does not like to be in a very hot sunny area and as you can see from the map here it's uh, pretty widespread uh, this is arctic fire this is a north american native selection or a cultivar grows a lot shorter three to four feet high and wide, has the same kind of wonderful uh, red stems. This is what it looks like during the growing season. And uh, you see the, stem, the red stems throughout the growing season. And this is what the coloring of the foliage is in the fall, depending on how much uh, sun they get. Um, winterberry holly, look how beautiful that looks. Um, and this is what it looks like in the winter time. Uh, now, uh, in order to have these beautiful berries, it has to be a female plant. And here are some of the female varieties. However, in order, it's a holly. So in order for it to have these berries, it needs to have a pollinizer, a male pollinizer. And when you do get uh, these plants, you have to make sure that they're blooming at the same time. Uh, they're early bloomers, mid-season bloomers, late, late bloomers. Uh, so please make sure that they're blooming at the same time. Here is a male and Jim Dandy. So uh, here are other ones. And who is the lucky female for this wonderful Jim Dandy? And uh, here are the varieties and it's Red Sprite and it will tell you on the label which ones are the ones to get. And they will live happily ever after along with four to 10 other females because a male is capable of pollinizing uh, five to 10 female plants. And they don't have to be right next to each other. The male can be, you know, 20 feet, 40 feet away. 
And this is what the red sprite looks like during the growing season with the berries. And here it is in the winter time. Look how beautiful. And uh, also, they also come in this wonderful gold. Uh, here is our native hydrangea, and uh, it's called lace cap because. It doesn't have a lot of these uh, type of a bloom. This is uh, these these are blooms too, but these are the fertile blooms. This is where the nectar and the pollen is. These are sterile, and their job is to attract pollinators thinking, oh, look at the beautiful plants. But when they come, there's nothing here for them except here. And you will see there's our little insects there. And at, um, uh, what should we call it, Mount Cuba, they did a trial on these hydrangeas. And this was the second most visited of the pollinators during uh, that trial period. So this was number two. Uh, this was number one. Many times cultivars usually do not attract as many pollinators as the species does. However, there are exceptions, and this is one of these exceptions. Look how beautiful these blooms are. They're 8 to 14 inches across. Really beautiful. And here is a close-up. These are all fertile blooms and these are all the sterile <laughs> blooms uh here is our oak leaf hydrangea which um, uh, is called that because of the leaves uh, they have white blooms that turn pink and uh, then um, brown or tan and here is the beautiful foliage that it has in the fall and during the winter as it gets older it has exfoliating bark meaning that the bark uh, the, the layer, outer layer comes off. Here is sweet pepper bush, um, which uh, blooms late July, early September. It loves wet sites, does not like hot sites, and this can bloom in a uh, part shade or uh, in uh, the sun. Here's a close up of the bloom. This is what the foliage looks like in the fall and the seed capsules, which unfortunately hang around and sometimes it doesn't really look nice. This is a cultivar that has a lot more blooms, is a lot smaller for uh, smaller gardens, and this is what the fall foliage looks like. And if you're into pink, this is the one to get Ruby Spice because it starts red, pink, and it stays pink, whereas other pink varieties, they start getting pale and this is the fall foliage. This is a wonderful St. John's wort. It's, uh, it, it doesn't grow very well. It's, uh, it can grow anywhere from one to five feet, but it usually doesn't. It has a lot, a lot of uh, uh, blooms. Uh, look at the blooms. Uh, it has a lot of stamens, a lot of pollen, and uh, it attracts a lot of pollinators. And there's also a larval host plant. And this is what the foliage looks like. And after it's finished blooming, look how cute the seed, seed pods are. They're really beautiful. They hang around for a while. And then when they open up, it shoots out. Uh, the three seeds that it has, and this is what the fall foliage looks like, and it also has exfoliating bark. This is what happens in the in the woods. Nobody comes by to get rid of these leaves, and through the years, it fertilizes the soil because as it decomposes, it returns all the nutrients that it took from the soil in order to have the leaves, and until the canopy of the trees fill in, we have these wonderful ephemerals, and one of them is this wonderful Virginia bluebell, uh, which is an ephemeral, meaning that it doesn't last very long. Uh, daffodils are ephemerals also. They come out in the spring, they do their thing, and they disappear. And same thing with these ephemerals. The Virginia bluebell comes in blue mostly, but it also white and pink. And by the time the canopy of the trees fill in, the bluebell is done doing its, its thing, and the leaves uh, get all um, yellow, and they shrink away, and then they go dormant, and they come back the next year.
Uh, they do self sew. Um, and here are more ephemerals. They're listed in your handout. Uh, again, I start out with evergreens. We're doing perennials now. This is our coral bell, American alum root, uh, Heuchera americana, and this is uh, one of our natives. And uh, this plant, uh, even though you can see the blooms are tiny, uh, they do attract the wonderful hummingbird. Colorful bulb foliage stays throughout the whole season and during the winter. It likes fertile soil, and uh, it usually uh, li it likes uh, part shade, but can grow in full sun. But really, it likes uh, part shade better. And the reason why many of these part shade plants like fertile soil is because, as I showed you before the leaves in the forest they stay nobody takes them away so the soil is fertile because all the leaves have been decomposing so they would like to have fertile soil um, and um, these plants uh, they do very well except they do not like standing water and they can be blooming they can live by the shore this is a wonderful um, coral bell that comes from the south, therefore it is very tolerant of heat and of humidity. And there are many coral bells that have been hybridized with this as one of the parent plants. Uh, look at all the different colors, and one of the places where they do do this is Mount Cuba. It's listed on your handout, and one where they do the trials for a number of years. This is one of the trials. They did 83 different cultivars for three years. The first year they plant them, they water them, and after it's established, they do nothing. And then what they do is through those years, they go out there and check off, you know, how well it's doing, how it's blooming, etc. And then they uh, print out these wonderful uh, trials uh, results. And it's, this is also online. Uh, here is one of the, the top ones that uh, uh, was rated as a top one, and they will tell you which one will do best in your area. Here's another one, uh, this caramel. And here, this one was one from the Chicago Botanic Garden, which also does trials. So please go on their site. And this one uh, has uh, silver foliage, with a nice purplish cast or pinkish cast. It's not very big. It only grows about six to eight inches high without the blooms. However, once it starts blooming, it grows up to 24 inches high, which is really nice. And when it's done blooming, uh, just cut off uh, the, uh, the spent blooms so it will, will look nice. What's really nice about this is because through the years, all the hybridizers and all these beautiful uh, coral bells that you have seen, uh, they all have these white flowers or flowers not, that you, they're, they're really not really looking really great. However, this has nice pink blooms and they're getting back into having these nice pink or red blooms, which is when I first started gardening, was the color of the blooms of the coral bells at that time. But that was like, you know, 38 years ago. But a lot has been done, a lot of hybridizing and a lot of trials. So read up so that you will pick the ones that will do best in your yard. This is another evergreen. This comes from the West Coast. This is what it looks like during the winter. These little pom-pom blooms, they bloom uh, from April to May. And if you deadhead, uh, they will bloom all season long. Oh my God. Um, so um, uh, they um, live by the shore and this plant loves the heat and humidity, and they are perfect for what's called the health strip. And you're wondering, what the hell is a health strip? This is what a health strip is. It's that part of your property that nobody wants. You don't want to mow it. You don't want to do anything with it. And it has poor soil, lots of all kinds of stuff thrown on it, pollution, including animal visitations. And you know what I mean by that. 
So this is one of those plants that you can plant there that once it's established, you really don't need to do anything. Uh, if you only have one plant that you can buy, uh, can have for your part shade um, garden, this is the one to get because this is the one that starts blooming in the spring and keeps on blooming without deadheading from, uh, throughout the summer to frost. Uh, this is what the blooms look like, and the deer don't eat it, not only because it's poisonous, because remember I told you they'll eat poisonous plants if there's nothing else, but because it has highly dissected foliage. They don't like that mouthfeel. So this is never bothered. So this is our eastern New Jersey uh, native uh, fringed uh, bleeding heart. We also have a white one called Alba somewhere in the United States. I don't know where, um, but it also comes in white. I have it in my garden. I've done nothing to it at all. It's been living in two places in my yard for, I don't know how many years, over 10 years, and I've done nothing. So this is a really great plant to have. And if you want another one that has a more of a bluish cast, uh, you can get luxuriant, and luxuriant is a hybridized uh, bleeding heart with our eczemia, our eastern uh, bleeding heart with Formosa, which is the western bleeding heart. And this is what they've come up with. And what's nice is it self sows. So you'll have nice little volunteers that you can plant in other places in your garden. And you can also give away to plant sales or to friends. Uh, God, I love this plant. I love all my plants. And I apologize for that. But this is a wonderful plant that self sows and what's great about that is that it knows where to germinate and it grows in part shade or full shade and it will form a nice ground cover what's great about that is it it makes it so that weeds don't grow there so if it makes a nice ground cover you will have no weeds and you will have nothing you will you will need to do nothing and also what's great about this plant is it's poisonous and the deer don't eat it, not only because it's poisonous, but also because it has fuzzy, a little bit of fuzzy leaf. Look at the beautiful buds that are fuzzy and the seed pods and look at these beautiful flowers. I, and this is great for a rain garden in the shade because, or part shade, because it can take uh, drought as well standing water. Look at this beautiful combination. Why is this a great combination? Because this is an ephemeral, the bluebell, Virginia bluebell. So once it disappears, it's gonna leave a hole in that area. If you plant these two together, you will hide the fact that there is a blank space there. So plant these two together, please. And they both like the same type of uh, conditions. A uh, charming plant. This is our wonderful columbine, canadensis, grows, yes, in Canada, but here also. And this also is a wonderful nectar source uh, for um, our, our, our butterflies and moths. Uh, and the hummingbirds love it. And yes, it has a tubular plant. And you've been told that hummingbirds like tubular plants. However, they will go to any plant that has a lot of nectar or a lot of insects that they like or pollen. So they are not fussy. They need to eat because they need them. They expend a lot of energy. But tubular plants, yes, and red plants, yes, but they'll go to any color. I was uh, not very bright when I started gardening, and this was all over the place. And I used to yank this out all the time, and now I hardly have any. And I feel so bad that I did this because this happens to be a keystone plant because it supports a lot of moths and butterflies as well as those bees that are that specialize uh, with uh, whatever they need to for, to uh, pollinate. Uh, and uh, this is edible. So you can take these nice blooms and put them in a salad, uh, but don't put too much uh, and uh, freak out your friends. 
Aruncus. This is a wonderful plant that grows in sun, parched, shade, can uh, tolerate drought, doesn't mind wet. And this is an odd plant in that there are female plants and there are male plants. And guess which one this one is? It's the male plant because the males always have to look better. And this is the female plant. Here is a close up of the blooms. Here is another example of the uh, male plant and the female plant. And look, the male plants have all these stamens and the female plants do not. <laughs> and this is what it looks, oops. This is, uh, this is what it looks like in the fall, the foliage. And please leave those seeds for the birds. Plus if it snows, which thank goodness it did snow, Finally, this year, it looks really beautiful when it snows, when you have these seed pods or any seed pods. Another wonderful plant is this wild ginger, Asarum canadensis. And here are the blooms. And in order to see them, you have to lay down on the ground because they, they lay on the ground. These are the leaves. And you wonder how they get pollinated. They get pollinated by ants. Uh, uh, because the seeds have this this thing on them, this uh, gelatinous thing that attracts them, and they take those seeds, bring it to where they have their uh, everybody else, their colony, and then they feed on it, and then they take those seeds and disperse them, and that's how this plant gets dispersed and pollinated. Ferns. This is a Christmas fern. This is an evergreen fern. Oh, I miss the, I miss the symbol. Uh, but maybe it's okay because yes, it's evergreen. But during the winter time, it's not nice and erect like this. It just lies flat on the ground. Uh, how can you tell that this is a Christmas fern? Because when you're looking at the leaf, look at it. It looks like a Christmas stocking. Uh, with the Christmas fern and most ferns, what happens is you have the spores. They don't have flowers, they have spores, and this is how they reproduce. And the group of spores are called sori, and this is what it looks like, and this is what the close-up look like, looks like. Meanwhile, there are other ferns, like the cinnamon ferns, where the the uh, spores are on spikes and it looks like cinnamon. It looks like a shuttle cock. It's a really nice plant to grow, uh, very easy uh, in a shady area. And here are more ferns that are listed in your handout. And these are, except for the male fern, they are all native to New Jersey. I don't know why that is. Oh, the pole. Okay. This is that plant that I showed you that was in water. And uh, this is what the blooms look like. It also comes in the pink and white. Uh, a really wonderful plant. Um, it spreads nicely. Uh, there's, um, it attracts, uh, the hummingbirds find it. It attracts beneficial insects. And uh, it can be in a rain garden because I have it in an area that gets a lot of water, but then there are long periods where there is no water. So if you have a rain garden in an area that's shady, this is a great ground cover to put there. Uh, here is a wonderful plant that was perennial of the year, 2011, and it has multi-seasonal interest. Why? Because of the beautiful foliage, the wonderful uh, flowers, that are light blue. They don't bloom for really a long time. However, their foliage is really beautiful, needle-like, hence the deer don't eat it because of that mouthfeel. Very long-lived, really need, doesn't need division because a lot of uh, perennials do need to be divided in order to uh, have more blooms and to keep it looking great. And this is what it looks like uh, in the fall. Look at that beautiful foliage really beautiful. And here is our native New Jersey, uh, Amsonia, and it has all the same type of uh, blue flowers uh, and blooms for uh, a few weeks. 
It is also a larval host and uh, it also has uh, gold foliage, which I think may be covered by the, that, uh, whatever that is. Okay, uh, it likes average soil and it can tolerate all of these things. Hence, it can be in a rain garden, very long lived. And it looks like a shrub. I have a whole bunch of them. And if you do have have them and you have more than one variety, please do not plant them too close to each other because during the night or whenever when you're not watching, there's there's something going on because when you see the volunteers, they don't look like either one of their plants. The leaves are a little bit different, so they do have offspring. So if you want to keep uh, those plants and have more of the same plant, plant the other variety further away so they don't do any canoodling when you're not watching. Oh, I think I saw, oh, I'm sorry. This is blue ice. It's a lot shorter. It's a, a chance seedling in a, an area where there was a whole bunch of the Tabernay Montana variety, uh, variety uh, species and it's short and it blooms uh, for a long time. And the blooms are different in that uh, the, the bud is a dark blue, like navy blue, and then it opens up to this nice light blue. It's very long lived too, really a wonderful plant and really no maintenance, easy care. This is a wonderful plant for part shade. This is Actea uh, from Mount Cuba. And what's unusual about this Actea is the foliage and plus the blooms. Usually Actea's bloom later on in the season. This blooms in late April. And also the foliage goes all the way to the ground. It's very well branched. So even after the blooms are done, you will have a nice looking plant. And you will also have these nice uh, <laughs> berries with these, uh, uh, what should we call it? Uh, I forgot what that's called, but uh, it's red. Uh, uh, evenings, I'm tired, so I'm really very sorry if words don't come to me. Uh, Zizia, one of my favorite plants. It looks like Queen's Anne's lace, only yellow. Deer don't eat them. It can also be in sun part shade. Look at these wonderful attributes, and it can also live by the sea. No deadheading needed. A wonderful thing and also average soil so you really don't need to do much and it attracts pollinators and uh, birds love the seeds and it's also edible. Uh, Jacob's Ladder, why is it called that? Because of the way that the stems are with the leaves, it looks like a ladder. This was in my garden uh, years ago. <laughs> it's no longer there because either the groundhog I think the groundhog ate it, but it's really a nice plant. And even though it's called creeping, it self sows. It doesn't have, it doesn't spread by rhizomes. Uh, look at the beautiful blooms, blooms from April to June, which is a nice long time. Uh, Tiarella, oh God, Tiarellas are wonderful. Uh, Cordifolia uh, is um, our native. And uh, anytime you see cordifolia in any of the selection, it means that it uh, tends to spread uh, and uh, make a little colony. So if it doesn't have the cordifolia there, it, it's a clumper rather than a spreader. It has these uh, bottle brush uh, foamy type of plumes in the spring, and it also comes in uh, pink. And uh, here it is uh, with uh, Jacob's Ladder, the creeping one. <laughs> and here are the different varieties that are available. Look at the beautiful leaves, really gorgeous. Uh, here is another one that I love because it loves my wet areas. This is Pacara, used to be Sinusio, and it's called Golden Ragwort, part shade. It can be in the sun too. My uh, uh, and uh, it can be in full shade. Look at all these beautiful attributes. So you can have it in a rain garden and it's evergreen. These leaves are evergreen and uh, look at the buds, really nice. And these uh, flowers are beautiful. And the reason why is it called ragwort? Wort is an old English word for uh, flower. So it's rag flower. 
And because when all these blooms are done, this is what it looks like. This is in my garden. <laughs> it looks like a bunch of wet rags. Uh, but it's really very beautiful and it's really worthwhile. It does spread. I don't know how it does in sandy soil, but it does spread in my clay soil, but not crazy. Uh, false indigo uh, or baptisia, another wonderful uh, uh, native plant, New Jersey native. It does have a long taproot. That's why it's very drought tolerant. It grows into this very shrub looking plant. It doesn't bloom very long. It doesn't make a good cut flower because it goes black very quickly. It has these seed pods that you can't see very well. And uh, it, um, they rattle really very. <laughs> anyway, uh, here is stick seed. I'm hurrying because I don't have a lot of time. I'm really very sorry. Okay, uh, this is a, a very popular, very common tick seed uh, throughout most of the United States, and it's also New Jersey native. It's not very long lived, uh, but it self sows like crazy. It makes a wonderful cut flower. It will live in your house, in your inner vase for at least 10 days. So keep cutting it because when you're cutting the, the blooms, that makes the flower think that it didn't have the flower because it needs to have flowers in order to have seeds. So keep cutting it, keep bringing it in, and you will have blooms from May to July and even longer. As I said, it's not very long lived. However, however, it self sows. So you will have volunteers that will take over after these plants after they're done for after three years. Also, plants that bloom a lot, they bloom themselves to death, basically or and or they don't they don't come back or they don't live for a very long time because it takes a lot of energy for the plant to produce all these blooms in order to have all these seeds uh this is another plant that the deer don't eat because it has this foliage that looks like needle is needle like and uh this one if you after it's done blooming in june you take it and you shear it off and new stems will come up and new blooms will come up and you can do that the whole season long. So you'll have blooms throughout the season. Uh, it likes uh, really uh, humid, uh, hot areas and tolerates our humidity very well. This is another keystone plant. This is uh, flax, our garden flax. Uh, it comes in various colors, but it's hard to find the species. Uh, and they do tend to have uh, mildew problems. However, uh, David, which was perennial of the year 2002, has uh, is mildew resistant, and it has blooms that are as big as uh, hortensia. Uh, hydrangeas really really big and have a van vanilla scent to it and if you deadhead you will have more blooms coming i cannot grow this plant because the deer love it but if you can please grow it because it is a plant that attracts a lot of beneficial insects including uh, the hummingbird as I mentioned before, cultivars usually don't uh, attract as many pollinators as the regular species. However, in Mount Cuba, when they did the trial on the foxes, this one was number one. This one had the most pollinators come to it. So uh, if you want pollinators, this is the one. However, this is a very tall plant, 36 to 48 inches, planted in the back, and the blues aren't as big as the other ones. However, as you can see from this picture, there are lots and lots and lots of blooms. And also, if you're deadhead, you'll have more blooms. Spigella, Spigelia, our Indian pink is a wonderful plant. It blooms for a very long time. It's very long lived. Hummingbirds love it. It has these wonderful tubular plants that look like a star, like a firecracker going off when it blooms. And uh, the reason why it blooms for a long time is that it has this nice stem of blooms, of buds, and it blooms from the bottom up. And uh, you can see barely here 
that it keeps on going for a very long time uh, as it throughout the season. Here's another Actia, and this one is the one that blooms later on, June and July. This is like a, a exclamation point in your garden, part shade to shade. I have grown it. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. Blooms for a nice amount of time. And uh, in the area where it bloomed well, was very shady. And uh, I can tell that it would want more sun because it was sort of slanting, trying to get to the sun. And uh, the buds are really beautiful too. Uh, here is fall sunflower, Heliopsis. This is a wonderful plant that attracts a lot of insects and is also wonderful to have uh, for your rain garden in the sun. However, the deer eat it. I grew it when I didn't have deer and I grew this one, summer sun, which has double blooms, which means that it has more than one layer of petals. And this blooms for me for like two, three months uh, and I didn't do anything. Uh, I was really surprised and then the deer came and now I can't have that. But if you don't have deer, uh, you can grow this very well. Here's another wonderful plant that uh, blooms very well and has these magenta blooms, these uh, wine cups. Um, and it, they close at night and then open up in the daytime. And the ones that have been pollinated, they stay closed. So they, tell, they can tell the pollinators, kitchen clothes go to the other plant, the other blooms. Uh, it does very well, but does not like saggy, soggy soil. And here it is in the in my garden. Yes, I got it. I got to cut you off. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, as much as um, yeah, I know we have a you have a yeah you have a. Oh few more. Jesus Christ! I'm very sorry. <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry. No, you're just so enthusiastic and I, I love it. I know everybody online has loved it. Um, it, yeah, Never so if you go through some pictures. Um, a couple of people have asked if we will share the slides. I have to see what, um, uh, how we, if, if we can do so, if we do so, how we're, we're going to work that. Um, otherwise, um, we will be sending out the recording. Oh, um, yes, yes, and uh, let yeah. me interrupt you. Yep. And take take uh, screenshots when you do the recording, because you yes. can see I pack a lot of information on my slides. <laughs> yes, you do. I'm like I have to make you into like separate series of shrubs, and then you know another day for you know, uh, but uh, yeah, the grasses. Oh, that's actually one of my favorites. But um, but I do I want to thank you, Irene, because it's just I, I, there's never enough time, no matter what one we do. Um, because there's always so much to learn and to pick up. And every time you do one of the, are your talks, uh, I learn something that really? I didn't realize I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I do. I really do. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so, um, I wanna, yeah, I want to thank everybody that came on tonight. Um, we still have 171 people, um, on and, um, th it's that. just love to, I mean, everybody loves pictures and you really <laughs> put it all together. Um, so nicely. So, like I said, the slides, because it's over like 200 and some slides, so it's not an easy thing to make and give it out uh, to people. <laughs> but we will see what we can do. Um, Irene's can absolutely right. Watch the recording and screenshot, then you have her slides. Yeah, because look at all the information. Yeah. You know, and everybody's looking for something different, you know? That's why I put all that information. Yeah. Yep, yep. But it's true. I mean, there's so many different parameters that and not everything even if it says it on there you may still want to try something as long as you're not going from uh some a plant that loves wet 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 feet and you're putting it in the bone bone dry place um you know, unless and, it has that. sun mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Parrots, I'm sorry. Nice. yeah I, i'm sorry i don't mean to go over no it's i, I mean hey we're loving it because we're plant people we're nerds okay <laughs> that you <laughs> still have a bunch of nerds on with you too because it's still 165 people yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, I love this plant. This is evergreen, by the way. We're going to have to have like a, a three-hour session. <laughs> I mean, 
Oh, and you know what's I'm... cool about this plant? I saw it all over England when I was in England. Okay. They love our, our natives and they use them. And every garden I went to, they had this wonderful grass. Yes. Yeah, I think I, I've had it, but mine did not come back. But yeah. I don't know if it was just where I had it got too too dry. But I it's don't know. Yeah, sad. I haven't it's had so it come sad. back. But it's so awesome. It's just yeah. yeah, so soft. You just want to pet it. Yes, and I do. I, so do I. Yeah. Um, so again, I still want to thank everybody. I don't know. Do you, is that your last picture? Um, I'm kind of like, oh, well, no, you can just cut me off because I showed all the pictures. <laughs> I, I went back. Okay. Oh, okay. That's, okay. Okay. Um, so I want to, again, thank everybody tonight for, for coming and joining us. And Irene, as always, a pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, just so easy to listen to. And uh, this is a favorite. Uh, yeah. Oh, I could... this one, my God, in the shade. <laughs> oh, the white aster. Yes. Yeah, from out Cuba. It can grow under trees. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't stop talking about plants. We have we have a lot of this at the uh, at the ag center. Yeah. So if anybody wants to see that, a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, yeah. Jerseyfriendlyyards.org. Yeah. Jerseyyards.org Jersey is a great place. Dot org. Great plant database. A great list of where to buy native plants. Um, yes. in broken up by county. Um, so yeah. So I'm just scrolling while you're talking. I yeah. know. <laughs> until you until you finally cut me off. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't do it. That's up, that's up to Patty. Oh, we're Patty, done. It's okay. I still okay. love you. We're done. We're done because otherwise I'm not going to be able to go to work tomorrow. Oh, okay. I need to <laughs> okay. Good night, time. everybody. All right. Good night. Thank you. Thanks again, Thank Irene. Thank you, everybody. Thank okay. you, Thanks everybody online. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs>